Okay, we'll go ahead and open up for our weekly Bible study on uh, September, I believe it's 16th, 2006. Um, I'm going to, as I do pretty much every Sunday, cover some current events. Uh, The reason I do this is because, you know, I've been in a church for a long, long time, and you can go to a church where you're getting good, basically solid biblical preaching, the problem that you run into is all the other stuff that they're not ever, ever talking about. Ever. And the Bible says in the end times that we're living in, in particular, the biggest warning Jesus gave was, be not deceived, be not deceived. He kept saying it over and over again. And that we need to be able to discern the sign of the times. Because he indicted that other person that he had talked to where he said, you cannot perceive the signs of the times. It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I believe. And so we want to be able to discern the signs and the times of the day and time we're living in. uh, Because that's something that was obviously very important to Jesus Christ. Because he said that. Lest Satan get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, what is the next big great deception coming I mean, I'm talking, there's a lot of deceptions afoot right now. But what is the next big one coming, major one coming, on the horizon? Well, most likely it's going to have to do with the Antichrist coming into power in some way, shape, or form. Now, he's been setting the stage for that for decades and decades and really hundreds of years at this point. Until he finally can come to the forefront. Now, God's letting him do it. Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He's still on the throne. When you really think about it, all Satan is 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 a pawn of the Lord. It's like Satan's, you know, basically a pawn. Which is what he's always really been, if you think about it. Um... But he's, an, he's our adversary, as the Bible says. He goes about as a roaring lion, seeking who may, whom he may devour. He's also the accuser of the brethren that, stand, that sitteth before the throne of God day and night and accuses the brethren. Okay? So, uh, he's pretty formidable, and, and, he, and he's got his uh, fallen angelic and demonic army. And the Bible says that's really the real battle. That we battle not against flesh and blood. But against what? Against princes, principalities, rulers of wickedness in high places, and so on and so on. So these it's more of a spiritual battle we're in, more than anything. And it's easy to get focused on the person that maybe these spirits are working through and get mad at the person. Uh, so I'm as guilty as anybody on that. Uh, but really, if, 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 if we can look beyond that, if we can always try to look beyond that and realize, no, this is a spiritual battle we're dealing with with this given person. If he's doing evil... Um, now, so having said all that, the, the next great deception coming is going to be this Antichrist coming to power. Now, I believe, you know, even as Jesus has indicated, that there's going to be many false Christs in the last day. Many false Christs. There's, there's going to be one Antichrist and one false prophet. Okay? But there's going to be many false Christs. Now, if you want to see how to attack the enemy, because see, the, the problem I see in Christian churches is is that they're always on the defensive. They're always, they're not taking any kind of offensive position against against Satan's kingdom, from what I can see. Now, the, the main way to obviously do that is through prayer, through the Word of God, through fasting, through a church that is biblical, that can come together in a biblical way and in um, uh, take an offensive position against the, the kingdom of darkness, against Satan. But how can that be done if the church isn't reading the right Bible, number one? Well, the, the Bible is the foundation of, of, of all faith and practice. Well, if you're not reading the right Bible... And that's your foundation. The Bible, the, the Bible says in Proverbs 11.3, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So right there, you got both hands tied behind your back. Well, okay, let's add to that scenario. You, 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 you're reading the wrong Bible. You go into a 501c3 church that's under the government. 
that's under the Internal Revenue Service is their main head. Now they can say they're under God all they want, but it doesn't change the fact that if you look at the bylaws, you look at the way a 501c3 is set up, you are under the IRS. You're under the government. And they can, di they can dictate to you what to preach. Technically right now, if you're in the pulpit really preaching the Bible, you're preaching hate crime. And theoretically the IRS could come in and shut you down right now. Now, will the IRS come in? No, they'll send another agency to do their dirty work. That's what they do. Um, when, they, when, when people get raided from the IRS, it's not the IRS that raids them. The IRS, there may be some agents there, but you know who they send in? They'll send in the FBI, um, the local sheriff. That's who they, Because they're the ones that actually have the real power to actually go forth and, and, and search houses and seize and things of this nature. Um, but that's a whole other discussion. So you, you, you got all these hindering factors going on in the church. And I, I don't really believe that, that, in a, that in a setting like that, you can really do much against the, the, the devil. You, your, your hands are tied. And another thing is, is they stay away from getting into specifics and dealing with Satan's kingdom. Because many, in Baptist churches, the, the common call you'll hear is, well, we don't want to give them any glory or any credit. We don't even want to devote any time to them. Well, let me tell you something. If you're going to battle with somebody, you're going to war, wouldn't it be prudent to study your enemy prior to going to war? Has there ever been a war fought on the face of the planet where the, where the top general said, well, I'm just going to sit back and just, I don't know about this enemy, and I don't care. We're just going to go out and... And face them. Uh, I don't. I don't really have much of a battle plan. I'm. I'm just gonna, you know, do whatever feels right. They don't. You don't fight wars that way. You don't fight it that way. Well, lest we be ignorant of his devices, lest Satan get an advantage of us. So there's a lot of biblical reasons to study your enemy that I see, and it's not getting done in the church. It doesn't get done. It doesn't. It's not talked about. It's not looked at. Um, and I am telling you, there are some deceptions coming that if you do not know about them, they're going to rock you. They're going to rock your theology. They're going to rock your faith. And, and, and I believe that, that, like the Bible says, that many are going to get offended and fall away. Well, if they were really saved, that couldn't happen. Well, listen, it said if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Even if they're really saved, that, does that mean that you can't? Does that mean that you're just not going to be able? Somebody uh, said if it were possible, they brought that up the other day that they would be deceived. Well, at any given time in any one of our lives, it's possible for us to be. I, I, there's stuff I bet you I'm deceived about. I bet you I am. But you know why I say that? Because I learn new stuff every day that I didn't know. Well. What does that mean? That means I was deceived about something that I was not aware of. Well, the Bible says in Hosea 4, 6, my, says my children are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, the way I've always looked at it is, is then the less lack of knowledge that I have now, this is truth, knowledge, there's a lot of knowledge out there. we got to be able to discern between truth and lie. My children are destroyed for lack of knowledge, but always preface that with this is truth knowledge. This isn't deception knowledge. We're not destroyed for lack of deception. We're destroyed for lack of truth. What does Jesus say? He says, well, if you are my disciples, now if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, the first premise that Jesus said there is continuing in this word. Well, what does that imply? Continuing the Word applies abiding in the Word. It applies living the life that the Word sets before you. It's, it's being a follower, a disciple of Christ. If you continue in my Word, then, then, you're my disciples indeed. Oh, well, I said this little prayer 20 years ago, and I've lived like the devil ever since, and they said I was saved and going to go to heaven. But the Bible says, if you continue in my Word, then are you just... See, well... It's not that, that you're going to have evidence of the salvation is, is what that's saying there. There's going to be evidence that the Holy Spirit's living inside you. One of the evidences is continuing in His Word. And then He says, And then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So when you continue in His Word, God's going to reveal to you His truth. 
Okay? Now that truth may not be absolutely self-evident just in this Bible. I'm going to show you some things today that aren't in this Bible, but the Bible predicts exactly that this is going to be the case. It's just confirmation of the book. These are just more specifics that the Bible already predicted. So, um, with this Antichrist that's going to be coming to power, if you were the Antichrist, and you were going to come to power, and you were going to try to deceive the lukewarm apostate Christians on the earth, how would you come... Think about it. How would you come? What would be the most deceptive way you could possibly come to the earth, and if it were possible, even the very left would be deceived? What would be the most, I mean, as a form, as a figure, as a visage? What about all these pictures we saw of Jesus all these years? This long-haired, hippie Jesus. What about all those crazy pictures? Hmm. Well, the Catholic Church painted pictures about him like that for all these hundreds of years. Oh, and that's a good source. You know what really burns me is when I go up there and and I see these uh, either New Age adherents, freaks, or um, people that are like Democrats or or, or pseudo-Christians or or people that have a little bit of a theology background. They'll come and they'll say, well, the Christian faith said for hundreds of years that... And they're not talking about the Christian faith. They're talking about Catholics. And some of the stuff the Protestants have done have been no better. Protestants put people to death too. I don't know if you knew that. From what I could see from the research that I have done, the the true line of Christians came up through like the Anabaptists and and in these types of groups that were always, always persecuted that never, ever tried to kill other people. They were just trying to per- maintain the, the purity of the doctrine of the Bible. They had the right Bible. But that's, again, that's a whole other subject. Um... And I'm not saying all Protestant denominations have been used as, as, of, 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 as a tool of Satan, but the problem with the, with the Protestant dom- denominations is they came out of the Catholic Church through Martin Luther, and what ended up happening is, is that leaven was still there to a certain extent. And so I'm just talking about purity. Purity. Okay? And, and when you have a little leaven, it's going to eventually leaven a whole lump. Well, that's what we got in the churches now. The, the lump has been leavened. The, with these denominations. It, it's pathetic. There's a lot of talk in these denominations. It's called dominionist theology. Meaning that we're going to take back the world. We're going to take back the world for Christ. And we're, and we're going to go into this thing. And we're going to go into the thousand year millennium. And there's not going to really be a tribulation period. And we're just, everything is going to be great. That's why they got these mega churches now that are thriving. That's the doctrine they're preaching. I mean, if they were really preaching do, true doctrinal Christianity and saying, hey guys, this is going to get nasty and, 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 and there's going to be a great falling away and, and there's going to be so many people that say that they're Christians and they're not Christians, they're deceived. Jesus says, many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we done these mighty works? Haven't we cast out devils? Haven't we done this and that? And, and Jesus is going to say to them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. Those are his exact words. I never knew you. They were never saved. They couldn't have been. Um, So there's going to be a lot of... But see, if if those mega churches and these apostate lukewarm churches, they're all in it for the money, if they ever started preaching the true gospel, they'd lose all their membership and they'd lose all their money. I'm not telling you anything you don't... None of you don't know at this point. And I've been studying what I'm going to be presenting to you today for a long, long time. I, I'm, I'm reluctant to even release this out on my email list because I'm afraid I don't really care about discrediting myself because I know that there's a lot of evil that's been spoken about me because of the stance that I've taken. Some of, some of it have been genuine mess-ups on my part and, and, and then things get blown out of proportion and uh, that's how Satan does things. Some of them are just absolutely total false accuser, uh, false accusations against me. Uh, most of them, I believe, are. And I've always been very, very free to tell people, if they have a problem with me, well, let's discuss it. Let's sit down face to face. 
I don't know how much above board I can be than that. Um, uh, if you live your life and you're not living in sin, not to say you're living in sinless perfection, there really shouldn't be a whole lot that you have to hide. So, but the Bible says that, that Jesus said, Bless you are ye when all men speak evil of you, and you are persecuted for my sake. Then what does it say? It says, Then for great is your reward in heaven. Well, praise the Lord. They're, 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 they're stacking up rewards for me. Now, I don't want to suffer for being unrighteous. The Bible says, Don't glory if you suffer for unrighteousness. And I think we've all been in that, that position where we have suffered for unrighteousness. It's just suffering for sin. That's all it is. Um... But blessed are ye when you suffer, when you're, when you're persecuted for my sake, and men all speak, all men are evil for you. So, you've got a lot of this deception going on right now, and we know the next great event on the horizon is going to be the, um, the, the Antichrist coming to power. Well, what I've been doing, I, I got, a, I've got on this email list lately, um, about these New Agers, and I mean, these are the creme de la creme of the New Age people um, I grew up with uh, not a lot of this but, but I've always been around this my whole life through my mom a lot she was into yoga and a lot of these other things that, that you're exposed to a lot of this new age adherence and teachings and things of this nature and um, I'm really anymore lately I'm, I'm really wanting to study my enemy um, I don't see the church doing it I don't see there any preaching being done on it. I mean none. I mean none. The only ones in the, in, the, in the Christian movement that are doing this are the ones that are so far off in left field. I don't even think they're Christians anyway. I think they're plants. I really do. The Bible says, By their fruit ye shall know them. And I look at the fruits of these ministries. This one lady in particular, she's brought a lot of this stuff out. But there's so many, when you, when you go through her material, there's so many bones you have to spit out. If you were an immature or even a moderate Christian, you'd get messed up reading this stuff. I even got a little messed up for a while with, with her stuff because, well, her name's Sherry Schreiner. And um, she's got, uh, I think, like 10 different websites up on the internet. And some of the stuff she's got is amazing. But then there's all this other stuff she's got that is absolutely totally off in left field. She she accuses Paul. She she says Paul was a uh, uh, bigot. Uh, uh, you know, just all these terrible things about Paul. Well, now if you say that about Paul, you can just throw out most of the New Testament because he was the author of about half of the of the New Testament. He was author of the most most of the books of the New Testament. Actually, Luke was actually the author of of the. He wrote as far as pages go number of pages he wrote actually most of the of the uh, of the new testament as far as just one author paul wrote the most number of books you know there's all those different types of books so if you and there's a there's this big movement now to discredit paul well if you discredit paul then you have also just indirectly discredited the word of god no directly discredited it because you can just throw all the books that paul wrote out well, then, you, then your foundation's destroyed. So see, it's very, very... It's not just about attacking Paul. Look at what that goes back to. Now you've questioned the Word of God. That's what she does huge. She doesn't read a King James Bible. She's in a ministry where... The, the, the woman doesn't have a submissive bone in her body. All you got to do is listen to one interview with her. She sounds like she's demon-possessed to the toenails to me. Um, her, her husband's rarely ever talked about. I don't even... you know. She sounds To me, she sounds like a lesbian. I, I just call a spade a spade. That's how, that's how her attitude is to me. And these women that get into these ministries, where they're the head of the ministry, I don't think it's biblical. I don't, I don't think it's biblical at all. They're at the helm of this ministry. They're, pre, they're teaching and preaching to both men and women alike. They got, and then, you know what always, 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 always happens? Pride. Every single time. Well, this woman has went so far as to say that she is, she is the only one on the face of the planet that is really in the true will of God. And I remember she told this story where she went into this restaurant, this Amish restaurant. She said, yeah, I was wearing my tank top and my shorts. And they were just so disgusted with me. And I'm thinking, yeah, God really is, God's really working on you, buddy. You're, 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 you're right up. And she was just glorying in her shame. As the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, they glory in their shame. 
uh, when you get really, really, really far away from God, that's what you'll start doing. You'll start glorying in your shame. You'll start calling evil good and good evil. And darkness light, light darkness. And bitter sweet, when sweet is actually bitter. Uh, or, uh, that's what you're going to start doing when you really start getting away from God. That's a sign of that. And you will start rewarding evil for good and good for evil. The Bible says, Who shall reward of evil for good? Evil shall not depart from their house. So if you go around rewarding evil to people, evil will never depart from your house. And I know some people that I can think of that that's what they do. They go around and they reward evil for good. That's their prerogative. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes... Uh, in this life or when I stand before the Lord uh, you reap what you sow you reward evil for good you're going you're gonna to sow evil it may not come around that instant you plant a seed it may, may take years to come up and, and, and grow into the to actually reap um, with this whole thing that we're, we're coming into with the Antichrist coming to power there are going to be many false Christs and from the studies that I have done, they're actually going to have <clears throat> certain of these false Christs go to different religious segments. Let's say when the Antichrist appears or, or before that, they're going to have, and, 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 and these, these entities, they refer to as the Ascended Masters. Okay? And for the Christians... Uh, that, I should start like with the Muslims they're going to have this one particular guy I believe um, that one's going to be Lord Maitreya he's going to be the guy that most likely will appear to the Muslims because they're going to be able to identify with him he's going to be the prophesied whatever you know, Muhammad or whatever Muhammad coming back or whatever um, there's going to be different ones of these ascended masters appearing now I don't know, and I don't think any of these are going to be the outward Antichrist. I think the Antichrist is going to be the head over all of them. And he's going to, they're going to point to him. Okay, in other words, he's going to have representatives, and the narrow is going to point to him. Just like the Catholic Church has their whole church, and they're going to be pointing to the Antichrist. See, this stuff is already set up on the planet. How it's 100% going to play out, I can't be absolutely 100% dogmatic. I left my crystal ball. Um, I lost it last week, so I, I, I can't, uh, you know. And, and, and um, I left my, my tea leaves. Um, you know, I, I lost those too, and and I forgot how to read palms. <sighs> you know, it, it escapes me anymore. I, I I feel bad about it. I was gonna try to scry that crystal ball, but again, I I, I dropped it uh, down the stairs the other day, so I I, I couldn't. I, I, I busted it. It was my third one this last week. I just bust those things, so I don't know what's wrong with me. So, um, with that all being said, of course, right now on the internet, you can do, you can get a, a remote viewing course, which is the, which is basically tapping into this demonic, fallen, angelic consciousness into your mind. They, they show you how to do it, and you can get in there, and you can basically foretell the future and see what's going on in other parts of the world. It's it's witchcraft. And they're promoting it heavily. On I'm on I'm on the email list. I get this guy's emails. He's a major. His name's Major Ed Dames. He was the main guy at the head of our remote viewing uh, governmental military project that we have spent literally millions and probably more like billions of dollars investing in. Our own government's doing this remote viewing, and it's 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 basically like high tech fortune telling. Is all it is. And it, and it works. That's the scary thing about it. You turn on the TV, they have got whole shows dedicated to what they call psychic detectives now. They bring in the psychics. You get a haunted house. we got to bring in the witch and the medium or the Buddhist priest or the Catholic priest. I watch, I've watched some of these shows. Every single thing, they, they never, ever, ever, ever bring in a born-again Christian to deal with any of this stuff. It's always a Catholic priest, a Buddhist, I, I saw one the other day, it was, a, it was a Taoist priest. He appeased the devils in the house. I, he gave them a fruit offering. A nice fruit basket always appeases the devil. I mean, yeah, I mean, hey, when all else fails, get the fruit out. He had a nice orange, a pineapple, a pomegranate. 
you know, this is a lovely fruit basket for you, Mr. Devil. Please leave us alone now. How stupid and asinine. But it got the job done. So the people watching it are saying, well, although they had to leave, they, he said, this, this is only going to work for a little while. I mean, and this fruit, fruit offering, I mean, you know, next time he's probably, probably going to want a T-bone steak or something. I don't know. He might want lobster thermidor with a little verde sauce on the side. Maybe some beluga caviar or pheasant under glass. I don't know. Where is it going to take a piece of these devil's dog? I mean, I... Anyway, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't help but get sarcastic when I talk about this because I see the way that, the, that that's what Satan's doing on TV in particular. And I'm not advocating sitting down watching hours of TV every day. But again, I will, if I do watch TV, I tend to try to watch shows that are showing me how the, how the devil and how the enemy is working things and how he's trying to deceive the masses. Because if somebody comes to me and they say, yeah, well, I saw this show the other day and this, this Taoist priest got rid of these devils. What are you born again Christians doing? It? And I've, if I've never been exposed to any of that, how am I going to give him an answer for the hope that is within me and, and show him... And again, I don't see any any ministries doing this other than the ministries, and I don't even think they're ministries, other than these, I don't even know what you'd call them, apostate ministries that are so far up in left field, like the Sherry Shriner, and and, uh, that that they're basically advocating all these things that are only going to lead you away from God. There's some truth in there, and there's things to be gleaned, but you better be a mature Christian if you go up to these sites. And I've been deceived before. I'm not saying that I'm not above it, but I've been through enough now to know what's truth, what's lie, for the most part. One of the biggest deceptions I see coming is when these representatives make their appearances. And it's coming. It's coming. In the UFO circles, it's going to be called... um, Oh boy, what do they call it? Uh, Disclosure. It's going to be called disclosure. Now, our government's been gearing up for this for a long, long, long time. Why do you think they got all these shows on TV about the X-Files and, and, and the UFOs and Roswell and, and, and all this junk they've been doing for all these years? You think they're just doing that for no reason? They're gearing us up. It's going to be the most massive deception the world has ever, 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 ever known. I'm telling you, it's going to be slick. Christians aren't going to have an answer for it. Because they're going to be thinking everything's going to be getting greater in their mega churches. But they're going to find a way to even bring the Christians in. They're going to find a way. Christians are basically going to think that all the stuff that's going on is good. They're going to be they're going to be going right along. Now these aren't real Christians. These are apostate Christians. They're going to go be going right along. They're going to get rocked from the beginning, I believe. But then when the dust settles, and these these um, evil fallen angelic entities give their plan, Christians are going to go right in line with it. I guarantee you they're going to. The Bible says that that narrow is the way, and few there be that find the way to life eternal. We shouldn't expect there to be a ton of uh, a ton of people getting um, saved in regard to the to the earth. The Bible says it wasn't going to be that way. Well, that's pessimistic. Well, no, it's not. It's realistic. It's what the Bible says. Now, my prayer is always my two big things I always key on in prayer is let the Lord's name be glorified and let many be saved because I think those are the two nearest and dearest things to God's heart. His name being glorified and many being saved. Because when we go a million years from now, those are the two things that will still matter. If you really think about it. I could work my whole life to try to help uh, cancer patients or whatever. And and, and they, let's say I I had a 100% cure rate. And everybody thinks I'm such a great guy and this and that. And I've done not one thing to help lead anybody to the Lord. What real good have I done? All of my patients are in hell. What good have I really done? So, that's, that's the way I tend to look at things. The biggest image that you will see portrayed in regard to Jesus is this long-haired, hippie-looking Jesus figure. Now, the Bible says, but doesn't nature itself therefore teach us 
teacheth us that it is a shame for a man to have long hair. That's right out of the New Testament. I'm not making it up. Look it up. Do a keyword search. I've, I put out whole emails on this. In fact, if, if anybody's listening to this, this recording and they don't believe that, just email me and I'll get you the whole email I've done on this. Dr. Johnson at ix.netcom.com Well, this is the Jesus that's been portrayed in the world, in the apostate churches, particularly by the Catholic Church. And you're telling me I should believe this is what Jesus Christ looks like? Do you know this is the same image on the supposed Shroud of Turin? That, that big fake cloth that the Catholics found? And that they promote? The Shroud of Turin. Hmm. Face of Jesus. It, it lines up with this face. Well, you know something? It said that when Jesus was on the cross, that his visage was so marred, his, 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 his visage, his, his image was so marred that no man could even recognize him. He was bored from head to toe. And you're telling me when they wrapped him in that cloth, he's just going to have this perfect face? Give me a break. That ain't, that ain't how it, that's not how it played out. That, that, that shroud's been found to be a lie and a fraud anyway. But it, but it perpetuates in this whole image of what we perceive Jesus looks like. Be careful, because that that's not what he looks like. It's not. And this, this week, I've gotten several emails that relate to this subject from this new age. And I'm talking, this is as new age as you could possibly get. The stuff that I'm getting. I mean, if there was a meter for new age, this thing would be off the scale. And this week they've sold, they, they, they sent me, um, you can buy these images of these ascended masters that I've been talking about. Okay, now, um, the first image they have of their ascended masters is Jesus Christ. Now, you're going to buy this off the most occult New Age website that you're going to be able to find. First image they got is Jesus. They say he's Jesus. It's not Jesus. That's the classic picture we all we all see of of Jesus. That's the that's the one that that you know we right. So this is this is this is what everybody's expecting. What if you got this lukewarm Christian and this is all they've ever known? This is all it's going to take to deceive him. He can say whatever he wants to say, just about just as long as he looks like him. Well, the devil. The Bible says the devil can appear as, as an angel of light. And it, then it says it's no marvel if his ministers can also appear as an angel of light. How hard is it going to be for Satan to fake this? Give me a break. He can appear anyway, you know. So, um, then the next guy they got is a guy named El Moriah. El Moriah is the Lord of the First Ray, which is the blue ray of the will of God. And this is all New Age. He and St. Germain work closely together. Now we're going to talk about St. Germain in a second. Now these ascended masters are supposedly working together. Actually, and there's a picture, I don't know if you've ever seen this picture, of Madame Helena Petrova Blavatsky, the one of the, probably the most, e- most evil woman that lived in the whole 1800s. This woman was satanically possessed to the toenails. Hitler was a, was a follower of her. She started the House of Theosophy. The woman was... I, she was so stinking evil. I, I don't even know where to begin with her. Okay, and she was she was flat out Luciferian, flat out. She, she, I mean, so there's a picture of her with this El Mirai guy and Saint Germain, and uh, I don't know if Jesus was in there or not. This fake Jesus. There's an actual picture. Now you go further in their pictures that they're selling. I mean, they're what, 15 bucks for an 8x10? I mean, that's a little steep. You can't even catch a break on a New Age site anymore. What's the world coming to? You know, I was really angry. Uh, you know, an 8x10 glossy for 15 bucks? Oh, come on. They'll rip you off with this stuff, man. They'll rip you off. This is Archangel Michael. Now, he's a good archangel. But see, is it no marvel, therefore, that Satan can transform his ministers into an angel of light? 
Archangel Michael right there. Get you raped by ten glossy. Well, they're, they're very... Most of these figures are very androgynous looking most of the time. In other words, you look at them and you're like, is that like a, a woman or a man? What is that? That's called being androgynous. But having both male and female sex organs is one of the attributes of, of gods like uh, Baphomet, who is like the main god that the, um, the Masons worship. Baphomet. The goat of Mendes. When you see Baphomet, he has breasts, yet he looks that he's got this big satanic goat head. Yeah, well, if you think about it, Satan is always wanting to warp and twist and pervert as much as he possibly, possibly can. And that's about as warped and twisted. And that's why he loves homosexuality and sodomy so much, because it's so stinking, warped and, and tw perverted and tw twisted. When you participate in these activities, it, it allows the demons to come into you easier and possess you easier. That's why he loves it. He loves it. Um, then you got Mike, Michael the Archangel here. And you can see his wings in the back. And you, you would see Archangel Michael's wings here. I don't see one place in the Bible where it says angels have wings. You know where I see they have wings? Seraphim and cherubim. Yeah, they do. But there's not millions and millions of seraphim and cherubim flying around. Those are the highest of the highest. Who was Satan? The Bible says that Satan was the anointed, was the anointed cherub that covereth. He covered the throne of God most likely. Cherub has four faces. Wow, what is it? An ox, an eagle, a human face. Uh, what's the last one? I forget. Yeah, yeah, a lion. Yeah, he's got four faces. But he appears as a as a um, his body. Many, uh, I believe, appears as like the body of a of an ox. That is why they call the devil old split foot. Because he was the anointed cherub that covereth. And I believe that's one of the ways he manifests himself. With split foot. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's all kind of things that are going on today. Um, but the... Uh, yeah, the, I'm looking at these two pictures of, of Michael. Uh, this fake demonic Michael. All I gotta do is see that he's got wings. Pretty much. And that's the New Age representation. Always, always, always angels have wings. And people think they're good, and they're not. And they bring them into their house, and they have images of them, and they're bringing devils into their house, is what they're doing. They're giving them access. And then it has the Archangel Gabriel. He's got his wings. You know? Um, so, it would be very, 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 very careful. Never one time in the whole Bible does an angel appear with wings ever. They always appear as men. And they also don't appear with these halo. You see these, these round halos around their heads that the Catholic Church always puts in there? That's called an Egyptian sun disk. Okay? That's also a dead giveaway that it's evil. So they're easy. For me, it's easy to look at. An angel with wings, evil. An angel with a halo, evil. A woman angel with wings, real evil. A little child cherub with wings, real evil. So, it, you know, but is this stuff being taught in the churches? No. Oh, no, we, we, we don't want to get into this. Then we get into this guy named St. Germain. And um, St. Germain supposedly was born in like 1567. He's an ascended master. He, he's, he's lived for all these hundreds and hundreds of years. He fakes his death like every hundred years. Oh yeah, no, seriously. This is what they, this is what they teach. And uh, they believe Jesus is no different. You know, he faked his death on the cross. He, he took up with Mary Magdalene. I was watching this tape the other day of this New Age guy, and, and he just kept referring to Mary Magdalene as Jesus' wife. And I was, I was coming unglued. I cannot keep my mouth shut when this stuff starts happening. When you start going after Jesus Christ, I, I, I uh, and, um, I was really praying God deal with this guy and shut his blasphemous mouth. Because, you know something, him speaking that blasphemy ain't doing anybody any good except bringing people to hell. And, uh, and I don't, I don't want to see the guy go to hell. I don't. 
but I don't want to see him take any more people to hell than he's already taking. What an, I, I was watching this, this DVD in almost disbelief of the asinine things that were coming out of this man. Every bit of it was his own demonic, twisted, warped opinion. His name's William Henry. He's one of the worst New Age adherents I have ever seen in my life. And it was so stupid and asinine what was coming out of his mouth. He just twisted everything. Everything that came out of his mouth was his own stupid, stinking, dumb interpretation of the Bible or the New Age. It had no basis in fact. Nothing. And I thought to myself, this is the end product. When you're ultimately, ultimately deceived and you perceive yourself to be a god... You think that basically everything coming out of your mouth is truth. And everything coming out of this guy's mouth was virtually a lie. Just about everything. Um, this is uh, evidently St. Germain. He's, he's known as the man of the violet flame, whatever that is. And that he's got, this is his symbol. It's an upside down heart with a spiral in it. Now, I really don't know what the significance of that is. I haven't really studied that out. Evidently, this is new. And uh, you can order a 5x7 of this for seven seventy seven. Notice the price. <laughs> I'm surprised it's not six sixty six, But I think they don't want to be quite that overt. You know, because they, they want to present him as good. And seven, 7 is considered the number of perfection. So, yeah, it says, I am St. Germain, and it has this purple heart upside down with a spiral in the middle. Here's a picture of the old boy, Ascended Master. Um, now, this is, one of these pictures was taken of him in the 1700s. Um, and this is him today. So, the, you know, he's, he, he aged well. I, I, you got to give him that. I mean, I think he even looks better today than he did back in the 1700s. Well, now I'm going to tell you his secret. He's got his own skincare line. He does. He's got his own skincare line. Hey, we haven't received. He's got a Saint Germain beauty cream. Now, all you women out there, you can go up on the internet. You can get your Saint Germain beauty queen cream. You rub it on at night. Rub your wrinkles away. It's wonderful. I ordered, I ordered a gross of them. I, I, I got a confession. I ordered 144 gross because I, I want to stock up for the tribulation. I want to look good going in the tribulation now. I want to be a handsome devil. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, that's him. That's him. He's one of the ascended mat. He's one of the big ones. Now, I'm not just showing you this to fill time or this is what this is this is somebody that in our in our lifetime I'm serious we may have to absolutely totally contend with and be able to give an answer for the hope that is within us because if this guy appears out of the sky and comes and says I am the savior that whatever he's going to say and you have never you have no clue and you're like well what, what do I do what, uh, how are you going to go against this here's the picture of of um, Madame Blavatsky now she lived in the 1800s this other guy named Kutumi, who's another ascended master, El Morai, who was one of the first guys, and Saint Germain. There's the picture. There's the black and white. You can order it online. Now, if that's a real authentic picture, I wouldn't be surprised if it is. Because these devils can manifest anytime, anywhere. They don't die. The only time they're going to really truly die is when they're cast in the lake of fire. And even then, they're not going to die. They're still going to be there suffering. The Bible says that the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. That's why it was prepared for them. But, you know, if somebody saw that picture, well, Madame Blavatsky was with St. Germain and he doesn't look a day over 30. Well, he aged well. It's all that beauty cream. We, we just had been brought up that, that many times you'll actually see these entities wearing a cross. And this one I'm looking right at, St. Germain, he's wearing what they call an iron cross, which is what you would be considered in the, uh, in the Germans would wear. It was one of the war medals. Um, but yes, this time this, he's wearing a star here. It, I really couldn't say that that's a pentagram. Because a pentagram, you usually think of having a circle around the star, the outer borders. How God views it, I'm not 100% sure. Um, 
but I, if, I mean, uh, I have the tendency to avoid wearing anything that is a star, or um, I, I don't. You know, the whole thing about the cross, that's a whole other subject. You can go up to occult Jewish sites and buy Christian crosses off occult Jewish sites, and they'll tell you this symbol predates Christianity. The Bible says that whosoever hangeth on a cross is cursed. The Bible says the cross is a curse. I'm sorry, I'm a little reluctant to hang one of those around my neck. Um, oh, you now you're really gone overboard. Now you're really... Uh, where does Jesus Christ ever say? Where does John the Baptist ever... Where does Paul ever say? Where does Luke ever say that we need to symbolize ourselves with any symbol at all? Period. Where does he ever say that? Well, I got that Jesus fish on my car. Well, that's a symbol of Dagon. You know what that's also the symbol of? In Egyptian hieroglyphs, in fact, this guy brought this out that I was watching the other night, one of the few true things he brought out. He showed that that is an Egyptian hieroglyph for the, for the heron, the bird, the heron, and they worshipped the heron as a god. See, the Egy- Egyptians worshipped everything. They, I think they worshipped the dung beetle. I mean, they, they're, they're stupid. They worship everything. It's like Buddhists today and Hinduism. They worship everything. They got millions of gods. They worship the heron had a lot to do with reincarnation and things of that nature. That was the heron symbol in Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's also the symbol of Dagon. Remember Dagon in the Bible when the Philistines came in and um, uh, they, they took Samson, they had already put his eyes out and they took him to the, to the temple of Dagon and he pushed the, the pillars away and the whole temple came down, killed everybody. I think we're going to see Samson in heaven though because I mean he did the, his last request, God granted it's not like God didn't chasten him. The Bible says, Whom the Lord loveth, he also chasteneth. I think we're going to see Samson in heaven. I think we're going to see Lot in heaven. He's mentioned in the Bible in a positive way. It says, Righteous Lot vexed his soul day to day. How could he be righteous and sleep with his two daughters? Well, granted, he was totally drunk. I understand that, and they got him drunk. Granted, he was living in Sodom. I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think, I mean, I personally, I. You, you kind of look at that and say, well, Lord, God is long-suffering and merciful. And you don't know how God, God views us differently than, than we can view another person. He sees right into our heart. He knows what's going on in there. So, I don't know. But these Ascended Master guys, uh, this is something that I really do believe that the Christians are going to be confronted with. And they're not going to have a clue how to deal with it. This one picture, here's St. Germain's wearing a iron cross, which is what you always associate with, um, it's, it's an occult symbol. He's got a pyramid in the background, of, in the back of his head, this flaming pyramid, uh, with a hexagram at the top of it, and then two little wings coming out of each side. Oh, I see what's on the wings. Did you see what's on the wings? The one has a was kind of a large uh, Latin looking A, and the other has the Omega symbol, meaning that he is the Alpha and the Omega. Ah, oh. oh, blasphemous devil! I pray to God he be bound and cast in the bottomless of pit, because you know something? That's where the devils don't want to go. They said it to Jesus. They said, "We don't, 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 don't cast us into the pit. Don't cast us into the abyss." They said that when he was dealing with the maniac, uh, uh, whatever it's called. Uh, Garandima, the one guy that was naked and he was tearing the chains, when the devils came to them and the devils identified themselves as legion, they say, don't don't cast us in the abyss. They don't want to go there. I pray, I pray to God all these end up. So anyway, these are some these are some pictures that, that you can go up there and buy. Now here's a nice picture of St. Germain in a white suit. He's, he's looking rather dapper. I, dare I say dashing in this. And here's, here's some more pictures you can look at. And uh, they're uh, I, and I think all these are printed on acid-free paper, so they'll they'll last up for posterity. These are going to be good twenty years from now too. Don't worry, you know. They're, Star David again. Star David. They always have the hexagram all over everything. Oh, but it's but it's but it's, but it's Jewish. It's Jew- we can't say anything against this because it's Jewish. I don't want to be accused of being anti-Semitic. I'm, I don't care what you accuse me of. I'm anti-satanic. And it is the most satanic symbol in all of witchcraft. Ask a witch. 
I mean, it's the symbol you cast on the ground to summon a demon from another plane. So, you know, don't tell me it's, it's, a, it's a good symbol. It's straight from the pit of... It's a, it's a six-pointed star, six, which is an evil number. It's a hex a gram. Hex, meaning curse. It is, I believe, probably the seal of Solomon, but it's not the star of David. Why do I say it's the seal of Solomon? Because he got in and off all this, uh, into all this wild witchcraft at the end of his life. So, you've got all these, these fallen angels that I, that I believe are appearing as, as these ascended masters. And um, you've got these people doing this. And you got this one Saint Germain guy. He's got he's holding a, a, a like a uh, three dimensional hexagram in his hand, six pointed star. Um, it's just all straight from the pit of hell. All of this, all of this. Here's another picture. This is a picture of Jesus and Saint Germain together. They're 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 given their. I bet you that's a Masonic handshake. I can't see it, but it looks like it would be. But another name that they call Sananda is Jesus. This they could have just as well had Sananda, actually Sananda, yeah, Sananda. They could have just had Jesus Sananda there too. That's 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 what they would normally will call him, not Jesus Christ. They'll call him Jesus the Ascended Master or Sananda. Well, who's Sananda? Sananda's the Ascended Master. He's going to come as Jesus Christ, but, but his New Age followers are going to know him as Sananda. Oh, Master Jesus. They have different names. Okay? Um, this is a picture of them two together. Now, this is off Sherry Shriner's site. There is some good stuff up. But right up here, she says, they're going to present Sananda as Jesus. We've all seen these years in pictures. His name will be called Jesus or Yeshua. This is not the real Yahshua Jesus. Well, I got a problem with that too, because I, I I've done whole emails on the fact that all the stuff about abbreviating their names to to uh, four letters and and all the stuff with this, I don't think it's of God. I don't. Everybody that I've ever seen get off into calling Jesus, oh, oh you can't you can't even utter his name, or you can, or if you spell God's name out, you have to go, go spell it with G D. Um, all this is witchcraft. It really is, if you think about it. There's a big movement afoot in the, in, the, in the Christian church, especially in the Messianic church, where you can only refer to Jesus as Yeshua, or, or God the Father as Yahweh, um, or you can't spell His name out because it's, it's not proper. Where does it say any of this in the Bible? Where? Everybody that I see getting wrapped up into this whole Yeshua, Yahweh, all this junk, they always, always, always get off in the left field. Every time. Think about this. If you're... Um, I'm trying to I think of the best analogy I could think of. Um, if you're somewhere and you're in great trouble, and you're calling out and you, and you, and you, and you want to call out to Jesus... But you've been brainwashed to say, oh, no, no, that's not his name. His real name is this. And you call out a false name, how is Jesus going to hear you? Well, he knows my heart. Words are powerful. And if you're calling out to Satan, and you think you're calling out to Jesus, don't you think that might affect if Jesus is going to answer your prayer? You know... That's what I believe these people are doing. I really do. I, I, I feel that strongly about it. Here's um, Sananda. This is a teaching. This is one of the classic pictures we see of Jesus. And again, remember now, they're just calling him Sananda. Sananda on, on the Sarah and Compassion. The Sarah is the whole other subject. But this is, this is his teaching. Tonight, I, Sananda, Jesus, or Joshua, that's what he calls himself. He's covering all of it. Tonight, I, Sanana, Jesus, or Yeshua, will address you. I am standing on the bridge of Starship Capricorn with its captain, Helena. This is how this is how asinine we get into. And I know this seems crazy. I know this seems nutty. But I'm telling you, it's coming. And it's something we're going to have to deal with. 
We will be working closely together in times ahead, preparing you for your contact, for contact with those you consider the celestial. See, they're going to have these ascended masters come down, and these ascended masters are going to say, listen, we're going to put you in touch with these celestial beings. The Bible says, so as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Had not the sons of God come down to the earth in the days of Noah, and saw the daughters of men, saw that they were fair, and took them whom they saw fit as wives... And then the Bible says in those days were giants, were men of renown, were men, the men of old. Shouldn't we expect that in our day? So, so as it was in the days of the Son of Man, so shall it be in the days, or, or, or as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Isn't this something we should be gearing up for? Why isn't the church talking about this? Jesus said that this is the way it's going to be. It's never even mentioned. Oh, you're one of you're nuts. You're you're one of those alien adherent guy freaks. You're not. You're crazy. Go ahead, keep burying your head in the sand. You will have you 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 will be. The Bible said that, that he's gonna when he um, he will send them strong delusion in First Second Thessalonians chapter two. It says he will send them strong delusions that they will believe a lie. And if they're already living in that lie, how are they going to be liberated into truth? If they've never even known truth to begin with. Um, they will be preparing you for contact with those you, you consider the celestials who are surrounding your planet at this time. Yeah, I bet you those devils are surrounding our planet, chomping at the bits. To give aid to your forces... You really do not realize that these wonderful beings are doing... You really do not realize what these wonderful beings, these devils, these fallen angels, are doing for your world and have been doing for you for many years. See, they take credit for everything. They take credit for creating you. They take credit for everything. They work with the entity known as Gaia or Mother Earth. These devils. That's who they're working with. And they are aiding her in her rebirthing pains. Helping you to be reborn as well as her reborn. See, they always have a counterfeit. You must, Jesus said you must be born again if you want to enter the kingdom of God. He said it to Nicodemus. Well, they got their own, they got their own apostate um, um, being reborn. Without her help, being Mother Gaia, she would have evolved without you, or should we say much fewer of you. The catastrophes and earth changes which have been, which were predicted would have taken place and the number of humans on the planet would be less than 10% of what current world population is. Volcanoes, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, blizzards and such would have created much change on the planet were it not for these helpers and you. A growing number of humans are awakening. So in other words, they're basically giving credit for the fact that we haven't been wiped out to about 90% of the planet because of these great demonic beings in the sky that are having mercy on us. And these also other new age people who are trying to bring these, these entities into our dimensions. That's a whole other subject. They're inviting them into our existence. Well, can't they just come and go as they please? God's still on the throne. God has kept them back to a certain point. You realize that. I mean, if it was up to the devils, they'd come down and kill all of us. And we'd be dead, all of us. Why hasn't that happened? Because God's still on the throne. But the wickeder things get, the more we're basically inviting them through and saying, yes, yes, come, possess us, and dwell us. And, and that is, I mean, that's an absolute fact. They're, they're, and so the wickeder things get, the more permission they have to basically be here. And the more God's going to just let the human race have it their way. God always lets us have it our way, if we want it that way. You, with the help of the ascended masters, these beings you name celestials, who are these, some of these pictures I just showed you, these ascended masters, and other beings of great love and power have cleansed a great majority of the mass consciousness of this world and have altered the timelines and prevented that which was predicted. Um, now, 
as the being known as Gaia evolves, you will evolve alongside her, with her, and into higher dimensions. Now, you notice they mention love. They always mention love, 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 love. It reminds me of the typical church you walk into, and all they talk about the love. You know some All these New Agers talk about the love. Higher consciousness, finding myself, evolving into the gods that we really... That, that's, that's what all this is about. Evolving into a god. If you think... You read this stuff. That's always the carrot. You're going to evolve into a god. What was the first lie that Satan told Eve in the garden? Ye shall be as gods. Satan's no different. So that's that. Um... We, we just had a comment made um, about uh, this whole thing. And there's a book out there called The Book of Urantia. And it is, it is, it is pretty raunchy. Um, just kidding. It's about 2,000 pages. Um, you can go and buy it online. They'll charge you a premium for it. And uh, uh, there was this one guy that had written this series of articles about how Paul was this terrible person. He was a usurper. And I was trying to understand where this guy was getting his warped, twisted, perverted doctrine from. And he finally, finally let out in the very, near the very end, there was one paragraph where he said, you need to look to other books like the book of Urantia, where basically this lines up with my line of thinking. It's always about their opinion. The Bible says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And um, this is, I believe, the foundation that really got this guy off base. You know, plus he, he adheres to partly the Quran, a little bit of the Bible, throws all anything Paul says. Yet yeah, he'll quote from books Paul wrote. The Bible says a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. So this was the, the quintessential essence of being double minded. Calling Paul a devil, yet quoting out of books he wrote. So you can't have it both ways, you know. Here's another email I got from him this week. And this is the connection between DNA and the divine name of God. Or, what do they view the divine name of God as? Capital YHVH or capital YHWH. This is where we get the word, I believe, Yahweh. They're they're condensing it into four letters. Okay, now, this is the big movement in the Messianic Jewish movement. That's how they'll write God's name. Or if they write God's name, they'll write G-D. They can't write the whole name out. It's not proper. It's not fit. Well, we're going to talk about that. Now, I put out a whole email how evil this is. And every single person I see get off into this because you always think you're more spiritual when you do this. Oh, I know something you don't know. I know how to write God's name the right way, and you don't. Now, I'm better. Aren't I? Sure, sure, I'm better. I know more than you do. Well, here we've got a witchcraft site. This new age, freaky witchcraft site, as you could possibly get agreeing with that. Yeah, you got to write it like that. There was a pastor, Pastor Travis Lane, one of, the, one of the things he always said was that whatever side Satan's on, mark me down on the other side. Well, if you're doing this, you're marking yourself down on the same side as Satan. Because that's what Satan's saying to do. And they, they prove this in this book called The Book of Knowledge, The Keys of Enoch. Um... I'm just going to kind of skim through this. The, the Keys of Enoch makes the correlation that the, this divine name was the key behind the transcription code of the chemical letters which developed in the human body. In 1973, while at the University of California, they began to understand there was a connection between the series of linguistic and genetic associations in the spelling of God's name in the biblical Hebrew. He constructed a genetic resource table using the divine name code and triple arrangement letters, blah, blah, blah. Um, Keys of Enoch, which has been translated into ten foreign language, as a is used as a matrix of our, of our language of genetics and this name Y H V H. Um, the Keys of Enoch details the DNA code as a series of matrices. See, they make it sound all real nice and scientific, so everybody believes it. The matrix is titled "The Words 
is titled Word Spirit. The Word Spirit table is constructed from three letters of this divine name, and then they make all these combinations. Um, I'm not... This is such drivel. And then they go on to quote the Bible. John 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Which cites a creative act with the Word, which becomes the divine, yod he va he which is this Y-H-V-H, as the God code within creation. But, so you got to understand, this is not a Christian site promoting this. This is as, as demonic of a site. So you got to be saying, whoa! But see... You could, you could literally take this and send this to a Messianic Jew and they would be saying, Oh, praise Yahweh. This just confirms everything that I've ever known. And they wouldn't have a clue that it was from the pit of hell. They wouldn't have a clue. That's what's scary about this stuff. And they go and they say all this blasphemous stuff. Sounds real impressive. Um, I'm not even going to get into all this. But... It's go- they're going so far as to and devoting so much time to this each sacred name illustrates a power attribute of God for example Abba Father Yahweh the God of Israel El Elyon the Most High God have completely different name natures yet they are the same God I think the differences in the name natures of God produce a major reason for the existence of major religions such as Jewish or Christian the different names, natures are also the reason for different denominations such as Hindu, Buddhist, Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Orthodox, Jew. See, we're all basically just worshiping the same God. Yeah. It's just that we've got a little different interpretation of what God's name means. That's why we all have different denominations. That's, that's the only separating factor between us. So if we could remove these barriers, then we could all be on one big happy demonic satanic family. Um... They, may, they go on to say they, they think that this is the primary reason that we as human community do not get along well and we hope that one will soon change for the better with the greater use of the power and the resonance behind the multiple names of God in short the purpose behind the divine names is a love letter of instruction and empowerment to do good works embedded in the human fabric cell by cell and to share in ecumenical fellowship for a positive feedback into the light wave whatever that means Ecumenical fellowship? What's that mean? That means everybody, throw out the denominations, let's all get on the same demonic page, we'll be one big happy satanic family, and we'll all go and burn in the lake of fire forever for eternity. Because that's where it's all going to end up, ultimately. Well, that's not really nice. I, I, I'm sorry, that's exactly what Satan's claim is. And it is not nice. And when you expose it, it doesn't sound nice, but am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4.16 That? that the Bible does the Bible says separate yourself from them it also says mark them it also says to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered for the saints I view this as earnest, earnestly contending for the faith because this is a huge frontal assault on our faith because they're going in they're not just basically out there anymore saying well, we're worshiping Satan they're trying to put a Christian veneer on it. They're trying to put a New Age yet Christian veneer on all that they're doing. They are they are attacking the faith. Well, when when our faith is attacked, we're supposed to contend for it. Contending means fighting. So that's why I devote so much time to this because I view this as such a frontal assault on our faith. Now, here's another thing. I got this email yesterday. The solar eclipse, the celestial beatitude. Now what you have here is a picture of the Divine Mother and her archangels. This is a meditation. Now this is, this is something having to do with September 22nd. Now at this, in this picture I'm looking at a, a picture of Mary, of, of this apostate Mother Mary, this, this Diana, this, this Isis goddess. Her, her name could also be called Hecate, who's, who's um, one of the di- was I've, I found one of the archangels that was actually not cast into Tartarus. You can even biblically prove that she was not cast into Tartarus. 
um, Tartarus was the special compartment in hell where the archangels were put that left their first estate. Hecti was one of them that was not put in there. Hecti manifests herself as Diana. Now we know about Diana of the Ephesians in the Bible. They had created this great, great, great temple in the book of Acts. And this is where they, they, they had this huge uprising because they went in there and, 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 they, and they basically caused these people who were worshipping Diana to second guess this. And say, no, maybe she's not this, this what we think. And there were many there that were making their living making statues of Diana and they didn't like it. So they caused this big uproar to try to basically kill the apostles and the, and, the, and the teachers of truth there for Jesus Christ and tried to kill them. You just look in the book of Acts, all this happened. Well, Mary's sitting here. She's got uh, this, this false Mary. She's got, uh, looks like, nine stars around her head. She's got this, this, this baby in her arms, which you always think of as... Um, baby Jesus. Now, where does this all start? Start back in Babylon, when you have Nimrod, who died and was reincarnated supposedly as Tammuz um, and, and Semiramis was, was his mother, but she, she also did she also marry uh, Tammuz? Or did she marry? Yeah. She married Tammuz. She married her own son. Uh, which is beyond unbelievably sick. This is where we get the Mary little baby worship that the Catholic Church built. It started way back in Babylon, Nimrod. Um, I believe Shem killed Nimrod. Shem actually killed Nimrod. Okay, Nimrod was um, a devil. He was from the line of Ham. Ham was the one that went in and, and, and did um, did this despicable act in regard to Noah. So, it's no wonder you came out of that line, okay? But this is where we get the original goddess baby worship. This Mother Mary. Back then it was called Semiramis and Tammuz. Then, then it became Diana. Uh, it's been different things to different uh, races throughout all antiquity. It, it just it's just the same witchcraft repackaged different timelines to meet that different uh, day and time that you're living in now you'll notice in this picture also that the picture has a whole bunch of little um, cherub like angels around Mary and the supposed baby Jesus and, and, and again this is one of the great gigantic deceptions that's already here and coming forth. Uh, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, supposedly it's going to happen on September 22nd. This Divine Mother and her Archangels. Now these the Archangels are all women. Uh, they all look like little girls. And they all have wings. Uh, they've all got these little gold crowns on. So we know they're all devils. Every single one of them. This whole thing is straight from the pit of hell. Oh, but you could show that to a Catholic and they would say, oh, what a wonderful thing. That's, that shows how to see. You could show this to most lukewarm Christians and they would say, well, that looks good. There's nothing wrong with that. They don't have a clue. That's pathetic. Um, the Divine Feminine, uh, evidently, September 26, 22nd, 2006, at 11.45 Universal Time, which is... I guess 7.45 Eastern time, I believe, here. Um, this, what, what is this? The, the astronomical new moon of Virgo. See, they, all, they do everything through astrology. That's why I stay away from your horoscope, stay away from all that junk. Everything that witches do is through astrology. Everything that the devils do is through astrology. The astronomical new moon of Virgo is on Friday, September 22nd, 2006. The 22nd is also the annular solar eclipse of the cusp of beauty. Oh, the cusp of beauty. Oh, it has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? The divine feminine raises her vibrational enemy energy. Of, actually, it is an enemy. The divine feminine raises the vibrational enemy of master number 22. Whatever this satanic drivel means. 
for the second time in the second year, we are about to encounter the celestial beatitude of the 16th eclipse of Saros 144. In this number 8 of the spiritual transformation... Oh, doesn't this sound high and lofty and, and spiritual? Doesn't this sound religious? It sounds real religious. But religion will get you straight to hell just about every time. Unless it's the true religion of the Bible... We have arrived at a crossroads, the midway point in Saturn, in the Leo transit. Doug, I just want to let you know that. At the midway point leading us to 2012. Now see, 2012 is the big, big year. According to all of the occultists, 2012. December, I believe it's December 21st, December 23rd, 2012. It's the end of the Mayan calendar. And I'm telling you, 2012... According to all the New Age gurus, that December 21st or the 23rd is the that's the time they believe that this spirit called Quizico will come into our dimension and basically come down. I believe with these ascended masters. Now, it may, now the ascended masters may come down before that. They're already supposedly manifesting all around the world. I mean, these people have seen these things manifest. Okay, a lot of these New Age people have seen these things. But I'm talking about mass deception, okay? Um, And they're viewing that as, man, that's going to be it. That's going to be the time. Um, The sign of Virgo is feminine and ruled by Mercury, the divine messenger. Mercury's a devil. Uh, beautiful divine messages and experiences can be enjoyed and blessed by your being. The solar eclipse also falls astrologically on the cusp of Virgo and Libra, heightening the feminine energy of balance, harmony, gentle heartfelt communication, sensibility comes to the fore. Uh, Isn't this nice and high and lofty? Isn't this nice and and drivelly? Vomity. Um, I don't know if that's a word. Looky here. Now, after it says all this drivel, this nauseating drivel, it is time to connect with others in the relations of beauty and romance with love, light, and life, the sacred union with the divine. You see how this is so appealing to so many people? It's so positive. It's so stinking positive. It all sounds so great. Love, light, beauty, divineness, godhood. What more could you want? What does it say after all this? It says celebrate Rosh Hashanah. It's the second, next paragraph. Celebrate Rosh Hashanah? That Jewish holiday? Oh, you can't say anything against the Jews. You're anti-Semitic. Bible says blindness in part has happened to the Jew until the fullness of the Gentile come in. Do you think the Jews are a little bit blind right now? Hmm. Let me see. Their flag has a hexagram on it. The person that basically bought the parcel of land that they originally came for through the Balfour Declaration of 1914 was Rothschild, which is the highest, most satanic Luciferian family on the planet. The Rockefellers and the Rothschilds are intricately related with Jerusalem right now. You should see buildings of their new Kesnet building, their new their, their new Supreme Court. It's totally pagan New Age to the core. But I can't say anything in regard to the Jew. I expose evil wherever I see it. You can call me any Semitic all the day long. The Bible says they were going to be blind. Well, why? Why are the Jews blind? Well, when they said um, to Pilate, Crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas, the murderer. Let his blood, meaning Jesus, be upon us and our children. They brought a curse on themselves. I'm sorry. Does that mean we boast against the natural uh, the, the natural olive branches like it talks about in Romans, who are the Jews? We are the wild olive branches grafted into the true vine. That's what the, that's what the Bible says in Romans. It says that that's what we are. And it says, boast not yourself therefore against the natural branches because it says you can be taken out. I'm not boasting against them. I'm being factual. I want them all to get saved. I do. 
I really do. That's my heartfelt desire. But I know they're not going to get saved by, by, by staying in deception. And you go to a Jew and you try to tell him any of this stuff. This one lady at this last church, Fiori, where's her hexagram? I gave her all the stuff. She doesn't want nothing to do with it. Oh, no, 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 no. i, I got to keep my hexagram. I'm a Christian. I'm going to keep my hexagram. No, it's good. No, no, no. You, you can't say anything against that. It doesn't matter how much proof you give them. They're under that demonic spell. They are. I'm sorry, but they are. And, and uh, I'm not saying every Jew, but even the Jews that come out of it all become Messianic Jews. Messianic Jews are all way off in the left field. I'm sorry. They are. I can prove that without a shadow of a doubt. They're still bound up in formalism and celebrating days and weeks and in 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 keeping the law. You cannot keep the law and mix that, commingle that with the salvation. You can't do it. Salvation is apart from that. Christ freed us from the law of sin and death, it says. You read the book of Romans, you read the book of Galatians, you read the book of Hebrews and tell me about the, keeping the law. You read it real close and ask God to open your eyes in those books and there, I don't see what any other logical conclusion anyone could come away with but that that's, that's not, that cannot be what we are attaining toward. Is the law bad? No. The Bible says God forbid. It is not. For without the law I would not have known sin. But you've got to have things in the right order. You know? You don't get saved by keeping the law. Now this is for all New Age, New Age websites. Celebrate Rosh Hashanah. They're telling you to do it. This solar eclipse also falls on Rosh Hashanah. The first day of the keys of light in the sacred letters. It is the first day of the Jewish New Year. It is the day of remembrance and awe. Time to review the last year and how well we have integrated the wisdom gained from our recent experiences. Does your heart weigh as light as a feather on the scales of karma? Oh, well, that's... What can I say to that? It is written that Rosh Hashanah is served by their heavenly court, a day to awaken listeners from their slumber. In Hebrew Gematria, 228 is the light of Yah. I believe that was the number that you were asking about. The light of Yah. Yeah, 228 means the light of Yah. Now, whenever you start to see uh, this one lady that I had told you about, that has these ten websites, calls herself a Christian, but you know says Paul's this terrible thing, only refers to Jesus as Yeshua. You know, basically says she's the only one right with God on the face of the planet. Doesn't have have a stinking submissive bone in her body. He's at the head of her own ministry, which is totally unbiblical. I wrote to her a few times, and I said, I said, you know, how do you justify this, this, and this? And you know what she came back to me and said, Yah told me it. That was about the extent of her defense. Yah told you? Well, you know something. If what Yah told you doesn't line up with this book, Yah, uh, the God of the Bible never told you, maybe Yah did tell you. In Hebrew Gematria 2.28 is the light of Yah. Now, the Bible does say, extol him who rides upon the clouds, Jah is his name, G-A-H. But you know something? There's devils that appear and they call themselves Jesus. There's devils that appear and call themselves J-A-H. They can take on whatever name they want as long as they're deceiving you. They can appear as a minister of light. The Bible said they could. So, this, this 228 represents the firstborn coming through the eye of the needle. Whatever that means. Um, anyway, I wanted to read that to you. Now, here's another part. This is from another email I got from them this week. Now, this is from a guy named Dijin Aquarian. Dijin. D-G... No, no. D-J-I-N. How do you say that? D-J-N? Jin. Jin. Oh, that sounds really spiritual. Jin. Maybe that's what he has every day before he goes to bed. Jin and tonic. Jin Aquarian. Oh... Aren't we spiritual? Aquarian. Mm. Does that mean he likes to swim? Um, anyway, his website is www. 
YHWHhouse.com. This Yahweh.com. They're, they're British. Now, what's another name for that? The Tetragrammaton. The Tetragrammaton is another a, a, a way that we could say this Y. HWH word which they say means I think like Father God it's used extensively in the occult extensively and it's usually associated with the hexagram which is what the Jews adopted as their pagan symbol that's no coincidence the Bible says a fountain cannot yield both fresh and salt water and yet they're saying it's, it's yielding all this good water all this, this stuff, but yet, when I look at the fruit of all this, it's all evil. The Bible says, by their fruit, you shall know them. Teacher, teacher, yes. Wow, we just had a couple good points brought up here. Um, the word jinn in, in Islam is where, uh, is where they get the word, that they derive the word devils from. And I also believe that's the where they get the root word for genies from. Genies, jinn, genies. Genie in a bottle. They're devils. They're devils in a bottle. You have a genie pop out of a bottle and he asks you for three wishes. You better rebuke that thing in the name of Jesus Christ. Because that thing ain't of God. Um, so, and, and then another point we had talked about where we had, where we had um, looked at this uh, interview. If you interview high level occultists, they will always, always, always emphasize, especially ones that are into the Kabbalah, which is the highest form of Jewish witchcraft on the planet, which is what a lot of our movie stars are getting into now. Madonna is much to the Jewish Kabbalah chagrin of the Jews. Now, chagrin means when you're surprised at something in an unpleasant way. That's what the word chagrin means, but it's a Jewish term. So if you walked in on something and you were surprised in an unpleasant way, that was what, that's why the Jews say, you can imagine my chagrin. You ever heard them say that? Anyway, a little trivia there, a little trivia. Um, but anyway, these Jewish people, I had a Jewish roommate for in college. I had a couple, so I know a lot of stuff. So anyway, um, you have these people that were into this, um, and they always, in, in the high level Kabbalah occult, they always will emphasize how important this whole abbreviation of the name of, of, of God, this, this uh, YHWH is, and then how it's always, you've you got to only refer to them in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the in the Hebrew tongue and all this other stuff. A language we don't even understand. We don't even really know what we're saying. Well now, if they're saying how important it is in the Kabbalah for you to do this, don't you think that might want to question if you're supposed to do it? You're, you're, you're in agreement with these high, high level devils who are telling you to do this. Well, this guy, this Jin Aquarian, at his website, www.yhwhhouse.com, this was one of the most telling things I've ever read in my life. Listen to this. Um, when you get the time, or if you should run across a copy of the great Masonic book, out of print but available at many used bookstores on the internet, called Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike of 1865, who was a 33rd degree Grand Mason of the Southern Jurisdiction of Masons, as you will read on page 697. In the 28th degree of the Night of the Sun, Prince Adept, now this is, this is the book, Morals and Dogma, which is the, the ultimate Bible for the Masons. Okay. Who was who was Albert Pike? He was a Confederate war general during in the Confederate Army. He is the only Confederate war general that has ever had a statue of himself, a large statue of himself, res, uh, uh, erected in the city limits of Washington D.C. Go do a keyword search online if you don't believe me. Why would they put a Confederate war general in Washington D.C.? Why would they honor a Confederate war general if it was the North against the South? Because they honor their own. Just why the same reason why George Washington's pictures on the one dollar bill and on the quarter. They honor their own. And he was an incredibly high ranking Freemason. In fact, he was the highest ranking Freemason of his age. This is the same guy that I have a track from Chick that basically says that um, um, telling the Masons that, that Lucifer is God. Lucifer is God, not Jesus, Lucifer. And I could give you the whole quote, but he but he basically goes on to say that the Masonic 
the Masonic doctrine should be maintained in the purity of the Luciferian religion. And then he said, then he goes on to say, if Lucifer were not God, why would Jesus calculate him? Now the word calculate means to bring, would be like to speak evil of, of somebody, in, in a false way. So he's basically saying, Jesus said all this bad stuff about Lucifer, because Jesus is really the bad guy, and Lucifer is really the good guy. Jesus is basically just trying to run his name into the ground. That's what, this is Albert Pike, Okay. He was also the head of the Ku Klux Klan and the founder of the modern day Ku Klux Klan movement, Albert Pike, this Confederate war general. This is who this man's quoting from now. Okay? Now, what I've noticed about getting these emails is how gigantically huge the New Age is coming into unity with the Masons. Oh man, it's huge. Why? Because the Masons are a compilation of all religions in the world. All of them. They are the true Babylonian mystery religions that started at the Tower of Babel with Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz, and we're coming back to that point. We're coming back to it. All the nations are being united. What was happening in Nimrod's day? All the nations had come together, and, 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 and they said, let us go down and see what they're doing. God said this. And He said, we have to basically split them up, because if we don't split them up, there will be nothing that they will not be able to accomplish. Why did he say that? Because if you've got the divine, the, the fallen angelic help of Satan, his fallen angels, and the humans, if you've got them all working on the same page, they can accomplish a lot for evil. They can accomplish a lot for evil. It's not as though God was intimidated by them. That's why he had to split all the races up on the earth. And they all had their own languages and they were, they were confused. That's why it's called the Tower of Babel. Because they're babbling to one another. Nobody could understand each other anymore. He had divided them. They all went to different parts of the world. Ham went into... Um, the Hamites went into more Africa. The, uh, the uh, Japheth went up into um, the, uh, Europe, in, in Eastern Europe, and, and formed the Anglo-Saxon races. The Shemites formed the Jewish races. The Middle East, the Far East races. And they all had their own different, different languages and dialects. What did this do? It separated a lot of this hidden occultic knowledge into different sects because they couldn't communicate anymore. Now we're coming full circle again. Via the introduction of the internet, all of these language barriers being broken down, all this sharing of the occult knowledge, all this beckoning in of all these devils coming to the earth, Bible predicted it was going to happen. So, you've got, he goes on to say here, um, the true word of a mason is to be found in the concealed and profound meaning of the ineffable name of the deity. The, uh, huh. the true word of a mason is to be found in the concealed and profound meaning of the ineffable name of deity, communicated by God to Moses, and which meaning was long lost by the very precautions taken to conceal it. This is how important this is to these New Age people. It is... The, in that meaning is included all truth that can be known by us in regard to the nature of God. In communication to Moses, the name yad he vah is given to Moses as the name Y-H-V-H says to him, I am that I am. Where does it say that in the, New, in the New Testament or in the Old Testament? That's their interpretation. That's how important this name is to a mason, to the New Age people, to the Kabbalah to these fallen angels. They're emphasizing it that much. Now, if they're emphasizing it that much as a Christian, is it something I might want to pay a little bit of attention to? Maybe? Oh no, let's just ignore it and act like it doesn't exist. Fine. Don't be surprised how, how deceived you end up. You already are deceived. That's right. yeho wa is what he's got this spelled out, is the word of a mason. Because Yehovah is the only God who said, I have created you in my image and my likeness, male and female, which means sovereign and free. Then Yehovah later created and guided the Israelites to establish a theocracy with universal laws, with a judicial system, which included innocent till proven guilty, mass education, and even animal rights. No dictators or fascists or even kings at first. The Israelites also had 100% male literacy, by the commandment 2,000 years ago any other nations on earth. And the Masonic builders of the Temple of Solomon had this ancient mission to see if they to see if, if that if even Israel failed to bring forth a nation of an eternal environment which would support 
Yahweh's purpose to create humans in the... See, they're, they're, they're attributing this Yahweh to Creator God. And again, if you are calling who you think to be Jesus Christ a name that is a demonic name, don't you think that's going to affect your relationship with Jesus Christ? You're going to constantly be blaspheming Jesus Christ. Well, I didn't know. Well, you're destroyed for lack of knowledge. You didn't know. Sorry. That's why we have to seek these things out. That's why Jesus said, be not deceived. And the Masonic builders of the Temple of Solomon had this ancient mission. Huh. See, they, 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 they traced their lineage back to Hiram Abiff, who was one of the builders uh, they claim as the uh, Temple of Solomon. Well, the Bible does, I think, it mentions Hiram, king of Tyre. It doesn't actually mention Hiram Abiff. But they, they, they use this, 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 uh, this person, this Hiram Abiff, is in all of their blood oaths and all these stupid ceremonies they do in the Masonic, the Masonic degrees and stuff like that. The Masons kept moving west with this divine name of knowledge in an attempt to establish a nation with a government of the people by the people. I teach this in my weekly Kabbalah classes. This guy's got a weekly Kabbalah class. This Yahweh freak guy. And I see this all tied in. I went on this tour for the Prophecy Club. I got, I was so sick of, of this whole Yahweh thing. By the end of that tour, all these people coming up to me and, and, and basically say, Oh no, you got to do this and this. And, and they're all in this, 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 this Jewish uh, mixing of the Jewish religion in with Christianity. Only referring to God. And I was sick of it by the end. Totally. And that's why I wrote that one email on this on this Yahweh Tetragrammaton. All this calling Jesus by these Hebrew names. I was so... And now I realize how important this is to the occultist. There's power in names. I mean the Bible says in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same in the beginning was God. The Word. He spoke the universe into existence. He spoke it. Words are important. Um, that's why the, the Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue. Okay, so this is important. It may seem something trivial to a lot. Oh, why are you going to, you know, major on this or whatever. It needs, it needs to be brought up. It needs to be brought out because this is important. Um... And then he says, let us also take note that the letters of the word America can be arranged to spell, quote, I am race. The I am race in America. You can rearrange the letters. This is how twisted these people are. Please feel free to use my writing with thanks and blessings. Um, this stuff is about the connection of our national language English to its Hebrew Semitic source, which I'm sure would interest many. Um, anyway, that's from that's from Jin, good old Jin. Well, I wrote a couple of these people this week. I wrote I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter. I basically told the one guy that wrote that that William Henry guy. I said I said uh, I said I just got done watching one of your your DVDs, and I said it was without a doubt the most asinine, unbiblical thing I have ever ever watched in my life. So many Bible verses came to my mind as I was watching your DVD. I really pray that God would strip you of every bit of your witchcraft, occultic power, so that you do not have the power anymore to damn people to hell. Because that's all you're doing, is damning people to hell. I pray to God that He humble you and that the Word of God and that you be exposed for, for, for the charlatan that you are. And then I just gave him scripture after scripture after scripture. There is a way which seemeth right on a man. That, but then, oh, well, that's all that's going to do is fire him up. It's not going to get him any closer. I also sent him a track, the letter. I sent them to him and the people sending me these, these emails. I sent them to them too. I sent him a letter. I, I reworded each one. And a whole bunch of Bible. I don't really care. I really don't. I want them to know that there's people praying against them. I pray against wickedness. Does that mean I want them to go to hell? No. I'm not asking God to send them to hell. I'm asking God, if it be possible, save them. 
but God, don't let them take any more people to hell with them. If they were to ever get saved, which I highly doubt, because they're so far off in the new age, they're so demonically possessed, but if, if, he saved Rahab the harlot, she was a harlot. She was, she was basically, she was a, think about this, she was a harlot in Jericho. Jericho? Which was, which was one of the most demonic cities ever on the face of the planet? Well, how do you know that? God told them when they went into Jericho, don't even take anything out of the city. Because if you take anything out of the city, you're going to bring a curse on the camp. Everything was so cursed in Jericho that they couldn't even bring one thing out of the city and not have the whole camp be cursed. Well, how do you know that? Because Achan did it. He brought out the Babylonian garment and with the talent of silver, or the wedge of silver. They lost the next battle at Ai. And when they inquired of the Lord, it says, because you have sin in the camp. Because, because one man disobeyed my orders. You lost, the, you lost this battle. They got like 26 people died, I think. It was that big of a deal. Jericho was that demonically infested where you couldn't even take an object out of Jericho. That's pretty bad. And Rahab was in there sleeping with the men of Jericho. Now how demonically infested would that make her? Yet, God saved her. And she's mentioned in the Hebrews in the Hall of Fame of Faith. And you know what? Look at, look at Matthew 1. Salmon beget Obed. Obed beget Jesse. Jesse beget David. Who was Salmon married to? Rahab the harlot. Who was one of the two spies that went in to spy out Jericho? Salmon. He was one of the two spies. He ended up marrying her afterward. If God could do that, then He could save anybody. Now, who's, who's also in that lineage a little bit later? Jesus Christ Himself. Who's also mentioned in Hebrews in, in, in the Hall of Fame of Faith, Rahab the Harlot. Hey, I believe God can save these people. But they've got to be willing. They've got to, have, they've got to be able to humble. See, Rahab humbled herself. She said, your great fear has fallen upon, upon our whole city because of, because of you. The terror of the Lord is upon us. We know that God is with you. They had heard about what had happened. That fear was falling on all of their enemies. And, it said that, and then she went on to say that there was no courage left in any man in the whole city of Jericho. That fear, man. Fear God. If that would come on the nations, a lot of people could get saved. Fear of God's what drove her to repentance. That was the key. So, I, I view the only way that they're going to get right is, is if God does strip them of all their... Because what they have, they have witchcraft powers that they're working through. They're demonically possessed and taking over people. And they're trying to take as many people to hell with them as they possibly can. The devil's through them. I don't want to see that happen. So, I think when you pray for somebody that's involved in witchcraft to have their, all their occult power stripped from them, for God to bring them as low as they got to have, for God to hang them over hell if that is what is necessary, is that not merciful? I think that's the most merciful thing you could pray for the person. I'm not, ask, I'm not asking God to take them to hell. But see, that's what Psalm 64 is all about. That all men would fear and declare the work of God. So, um, where are we at on time? Okay, um, I'm going to go back to the, the, uh, to the uh, study that we were doing last week on the reasons for separation. Um, these are just furthermore reasons that we want to separate ourselves. And we kind of touched on that this week even. The reason for separation, um, uh, there's a Bible verse that says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they that will increase unto more ungodliness... And the word and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom Hymaeus and Philetus, of whom is Hymaeus and... Now, there's, here's a great example where he, the Bible also says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil, the Lord reward him according to his works. Paul said that. Well, he marked those which were causing division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and he avoided them. He marked them. And that's in Romans verse 16, 17, and 18. So, here it says, 
We're supposed to shun profane and vain babblings. Now this would be lies. We're supposed to shun these babblings that are lies. They're babblings. Because if you don't, they will increase. A little leaven leaven at the whole lump. What will they increase unto? Under more ungodliness. This is why gossip is so dangerous. Because it will increase under more ungodliness. And their word, meaning the gossip, this vain babblings, will eat as doth a canker. Well, a canker, what does a canker do? A canker eats. A canker, like a uh, canker sore or citrus canker. Um, these things eat. Eat away. And then he, then he goes on to say, of whom is Hymaeus and Philetus? Well, he named the ones that were, were, were giving out, you know, all of this, this uh, vain babblings. Air corrupts and spreads. Compare the following scriptures. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And that was the second part of the verse I just quoted, Romans 16, 18. These people that do this, that put out these profane and vain babblings, and stay in it, and stay in it, the Bible says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. When it says their own belly, it means their own flesh, really. Their own flesh. Their own, their own carnal desires. That's what the belly is representative of in, in, the, in the King James Bible. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. When, didn't we just quote a lot of good words and good sounding words and fair speeches in here? All this New Age drivel? We quoted a boatload of that today. That's how they deceive, by good words and fair speeches. They deceive the hearts of the simple. You don't want to be simple. In some ways, yes, simplistic in the life that you live, simplistic in certain things, but you don't want to be simple-minded. Oh, I'm just... <laughs> oh, by anything that comes along, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> as long as they say God and that picture Jesus, that's all matter. <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's all that matters. I mean, that's how bad it is, though, in today's day and age. People are not wanting to seek a thing out and compare it with what the scriptures say. The Bible says your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? That's 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Now, I also quoted that today when the Bible says, when it talked about their glorying and their shame. They get so... The Bible says in a really apostate church, it'll get so bad that they'll start glorying in their shame. Now, we just came out of a church a while back where um, a man had taken a woman, left his wife, um, had no biblical reason to leave her, had been kicking doing this around for a long time with other women, left his wife, unbiblically, married another woman in the church who had also left her husband unbiblically, but the church gathered around him and it was glorying in their shame. You know, they were glory. Oh, we're going to, we're, in fact, we're going to glory in this so much that we're going to elevate them into, into, into the ministry. We're going to really put them up on this pedestal. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna put them up there and, oh, look at them. You know why they like to do that? Because misery loves company. Because, the, because you know what? they got a whole bunch of unbiblically divorced deacons on the board that the pastor set up there. That was the foundation that was laid in the church. They were King James only. They had, they definitely had a comprehension on the unregistered church. Of course, they weren't truly unregistered. I've, I've come to find out, but at least they had a comprehension. But you know, you go. You, I, I won't even. I won't even set foot in there now. There's no way. There's no way. I won't do it. They're glorying in their shame. They got all their their unbiblical divorce. Team. They got an unbiblical divorce pastor. As far as I can see, none of them are, are really qualified to be deacons or pastors. None of them. They're glorying in their shame, though. Every time he goes up there to preach, being unbiblical, 
an unbiblically qualified pastor, he's glorying in his shame every time he goes up there to preach. Every time those deacons walk in the door who are not qualified to be deacons from a biblical standpoint, and they go down and they sit and they take their position of preeminence, they're glorying in their shame. Oh, now you're really stepping on toes. Oh well, my life's not a popularity contest. That's why I have a home Bible study with three people. Yeah! <laughs> but we're all so happy we're out of that apostate mess. We are. <laughs> I, mean, I'm not sure. I think I can speak for everybody. Um, and, you know, God let us see it so that we could, could say, Wow! I mean, when you've been there for years and you've been in that and you can look back and you can reflect, you can say... Wow, I'm really glad I'm out of that. But if you had never known any of this, if you didn't know any better, you might want to think, well, maybe I should test the waters. Maybe that really is the true church. But we know better. We learn the hard way. We learn, it's like the school of hard knocks. You know? Well, God will let you do that. That's part of the trial of faith, I believe. And God will always put you in a position to see what it's going to take to make you fall away from the true faith. Because if there's something that can be done to make you fall away from the true faith, don't be surprised if that's the very thing that God tests you with. Now, you can only do it through the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not going to be able to tough it out and uh, you know and do this. And it's only through the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to do it through Him. He said in John 15, He says, "Without me, ye can do nothing. You can't do anything without Him. So, don't try. Rely on the Lord." To me, that, to me, that's comforting because it's like, oh good, it's not about me. But see, so many people, the majority of people in the world can't stand that. They want to be able to take credit for their spiritual fortitude, for their good works, for their devotion to whatever deity they're worshipping. And basically, they want to be able to earn their way into heaven, nirvana, whatever they call it, at the end of life. I don't, man, I don't. I really, truly don't. I, 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 if, if, if I were to try to get into heaven on my own merits, I'd be burning, burning, burning in hell and in the lake of fire. I know that. I want it to be that way. Because I know that the Bible says, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Now, if you're saved, you also have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And that's not in reference to the Holy Spirit. But in my flesh, we're three part beings, body, soul, spirit. Okay? When you get saved, you get not only a reborn spirit, you must be born again. You don't only get a reborn spirit, you also have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. Okay, the Bible says that. Now, whether we yield to the Holy Spirit, that still has a lot to do with our own will, you know. So, then it goes on here to say 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. So if you've got a lot of gossiping going on, don't be deceived. It's going to corrupt good manners. Consider the example of new evangelism. Its leaders renounced separatism in 1948, and within 10 years, it was infiltrated with liberal views of the Bible. One of the prominent new evangelical leaders, Harold Linzel, testified, quote, I must regret, regretfully conclude that the term evangelical has been so debased that it has lost its usefulness. Within a decade or so, neo-evangelism was being assaulted from within by increasing skepticism with regard to biblical infallibility or inerrancy. Many fundamental churches today have started out on the same journey as the new evangelicals. Fifty years ago, the same result will be the same. See, this leaven, I guess the point he's trying to make there is the leaven has just been permeating and permeating through that lump. They're not reading the right Bible. They're 501c3 corporations. I view that as foundational. I really do. And then from there, all those other heresy and apostles. It's only a matter of time. You're either, you're either getting closer to the Lord or you're getting further away from Him. And it's only a matter of time. I mean, if, if you're going to stay in this junk, don't expect that you're not going to ultimately end up being totally deceived. I don't care how you start it out. And it's not so much how you start out, it's how you finish. That's why the Bible says, Looking unto therefore Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, run the race which is set before you. Um, so, 
Consider the example of evangelist Jack Van Empey. In the 1970s, he preached in fundamental circles. Now, Jack Van Empey it was actually went, was a member of one of the churches that, that I actually came out of. Manuel Baptist over in... Um, he lived here. Yeah, he lived here. He, he was a member over, over at uh, Manuel, and then I think he went over to Seagate after that. He actually... Um, uh, there's the oldest... Bible college in the United States now it's correspondence but it is the oldest Bible college in the United States is actually in Pineland, Florida which is at the end of Boquilia, Florida um, which is right near where I live now I know the pastor for that church and he, when I was over there one day he had um this is his Bible college. Now, it wasn't always his Bible college. It's the, it's the oldest one in the United States. He had, I don't know how it had happened, but he had come about this Bible college. And he pulled out this big file drawer and pulled it. He says, do you recognize this guy? And it's this old black and white picture, Jack Van Empey. His biblical divinity correspondence thing that he did. I said, wow! So Jack Van Empey at one time was actually pretty solid, at least in, in, in theory, in, in his preaching, from what I was told. In the 70s, he preached fundamental circles. In the early 80s, though, he changed his doctrine. In the 1984 book, Heart Disease in Christ's Body, that's the name of the book, he denounced separatism and called for ecumenical unity. God comes into the heart of Catholics and Lutherans and Baptists and Pentecostals and God is in us. Doesn't that sound like this New Age dribble? I was just saying here. We can fellowship with one another. Within a few years after denouncing separation, Van Epi was in close fellowship with Rome. In his September 29, 1992 television program, Van Epi praised Pope John Paul II, calling him a great man, stolen his character and telling his audience that they ought to thank God for such a courageous religious leader. This is Van Empey. He's, he's up on TBN right now. Trinity Broadcasting. In 1993, Van Empey published a startling revelation, the Pope John Paul II, a video that presented the Pope as a defender of the faith. This is no lie. I've turned it on. I've heard him say it. And I thought to myself, what stinking Bible are you reading? And I mean, he's not reading the right Bible, is what I mean by that. That guy can quote scripture like nobody I've ever seen. Van Epi. You ever seen him quote scripture? Um, I mean that in more of a figurative way. I think he does. I think he, I think he quotes King James, but I also think he probably quotes... I would imagine he quotes other versions. I can't imagine him being strict in here. I've never heard about him being the strict King James only adherent. Um, I got a couple of his videos one of my patients had given me, and I, I watched them not because I was trying to get anything out of them. I watched them purely to see how Satan was working through this man's life. And I got so angry watching these videos. Um... The same reaction I had to watch in this New Age DVD the other day. Same reaction. Really, it was, it was that bad. I was so angry what was coming out of his mouth because he'd be speaking truth one minute and devil the next. And you cannot commingle the two. You can't. The air is always going to end up corrupting the good. Praising the Pope. All the, and I'm thinking, what Bible are you reading how could you be so stinking deceived? But it's the devils. He's sold out for the God of money. You cannot get to that level in TV ministry and not be sold out to the devil. I'm sorry. I, I just don't believe it. Somebody's going to have to show me. These guys. Number one, in order to do that, you got to be a corporation. you got to be a 501c3. That right there is going to open you up to major gigantic problems. Two, most of the time, they're never reading King James. And then, you know, everything else goes from there. So, I've seen Van Empey do it. Uh, I remember the first time I had ever turned on TV and I saw him doing that. And I was in disbelief. As a baby Christian, I was in disbelief what was coming out of his mouth. Because I even knew that the Catholic religion was a religion of hell. And I was like, I don't believe what I'm hearing. I, don't, I always thought he was a good guy. No, no. Evangelist James Robinson R Robinson is another example of a corrupting influence of air. He was once a strong Bible preacher preaching against sin and modernism and air. 
In 1980, though, he became a charismatic, believing that demons were cast out of him. In 1987, I heard him speak at the North American Congress of the Holy Spirit and World Evangelism, in which thousands of Roman Catholics, he said there, quote, I tell you what, one of the finest moral representatives of morality on earth right now is the Pope. People who know it really believe he is a born-again man. How the mighty have fallen because they have refused to practice separation. Well, I don't know if they were ever mighty. I think they might have been satanic plans to begin with. I think they might have just been ministers of light that started out just like Billy Graham. Billy Graham used to preach okay at one time, but he was basically commissioned by the New World Order. Um, who's that newspaper guy that... Hearst. Hearst. Yeah. William Randolph Hearst was the guy that the original newspaper man that was told to puff him, I believe. And in, 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 in journalistic terms, that means... Is, you know, get this guy elevated. He's the he's the golden boy. He's the guy we want, and they've controlled him from the very get go. So this whole inception. These people, I believe, are just satanic plants. Really, most of the time, I think that they started out that way. They knew what they were doing, but they started out looking um, as though they were uh, these men of God. They may have preached great, great. Uh, great salvation messages but you have to look at the long term fruit also and that's why the Bible says thus saith the Lord cursed be the man that trusteth in man and that maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord that's Jeremiah 17 5 you don't ever want to trust in man put your trust in man because man will always fail you if you put your trust in him Consider the example of Charles Fuller, the founder of the Fuller Theological Seminary. Fuller was a theo- f- fundamentalist and believed in the inerrancy of Scripture, but he brought into the new evangelical principles of infiltration and intellectualism and educated his son at the feet of the modernists in Germany. As a result, Fuller's son, Daniel, denied the faith of his father threw- and threw aside the doctrine of the infallible inspiration of Scripture, believing that the Bible is inspired in its doctrine, but not in its science and its history. Was that pretty accurate? Consider the example of J.C. Ryle, um, 19th century Anglican evangelical leader. He was the Bishop of Liverpool from 1880 to 1900. He wrote boldly for biblical truth, but he didn't separate from the apostate Anglican church and educated his son in Anglican schools. You cannot do this. You can't, you can't be preaching against something that you're a part of. You've got to get out of it. As a result, his son Herbert Edward Ryle became a Hussian professor of divinity at Cambridge and ultimately dean of Westminster, but he denied verbal inspiration, calling it irretrievably shattered. Irretrievably shattered, meaning the Bible, and labeling it as Bibleolatry, meaning worshiping the Bible, which is a lot of people will, will call anybody that adhere to the new to the King James Bible as the true word of God. They'll say, "Well, we worship." We're the King James cult. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're the cult of the King James. Yeah, we were just talking about how when these these people, so much of, of really, we really, really boil it back and boil it down, so much of what gets them off in air is not adhering to the King James Bible. Because they either have their extra biblical things, like their catechisms and things of this nature, that always takes precedence. I mean, that's the whole Catholic Church. I mean, the, 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 the whole papacy has authority over their Bible. And they don't even use the right Bible anyway. They use the American Standard, um, which isn't the true word of God anyway. Um, so, when you get off... See, that's the foundation. When you get off on that, pride enters in, and you start thinking you're going to be as gods, and you start questioning God's word, just like Satan in the Garden of Eden. Just like, it's no different. And then, you, and then just like Eve did, because if you really think about it, Eve had to ultimately question God's word. She bought into Satan's lie. How do we know she bought into it? Because she partook of the tree of the garden of, uh, the, the fruit of the garden of knowledge of good and evil. So we know she bought into the lie. She thought that she could be as God's. Well, all these people that go around and say this and this and this, and they, and they got their big theological degrees and their divinity, all that, all those those degrees have done is ruined them. Ruined them. I don't see there being a whole lot of positive fruit coming out of those places. I really don't. 
um, because it's so easy for pride to enter in. I don't see one of the apostles that, that actually ever went to a seminary. Now granted, Jesus was there and, 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 and gave them the education that they needed, but um, the pride that you have in today's modern religions and it always boils down to them getting away from the Word of God as the foundational tenet. And then, they, and then they get opened up to every all the other junk that they ended up getting opened up to. Um, consider the example of contemporary Christian music. It has been observed that fundamental churches that accept, it's called CCM, Christian, contemporary Christian music, soon change their separatist character. You can't, you can't have that junk in your, in your, in your, your church is an expect. You're gonna all the board, all the walls are gonna start coming out. Ah, oh, anything goes. Come in, do whatever you want. This is because of the doctrinal corruption that is inherent in CCM music. This is it's, there's doctrinal corruption. Even if you were doing everything right and you let that into your church, you are gonna eventually be leavened. Just look at the words of CCM and know that that is against the Bible. Those who do not separate from it are influenced by it. And that's 100% of the time. I don't care how strong you think you are, you will be influenced by it. The late Gordon Sears, who had an evangelic ministry for many years and ministered with Rudy Atwood, was saddened before his death by the dramatic change that was surrounding many fundamental Baptist churches. He warned, quote, When the standard of music is lowered, then the standard of dress is also lowered. When the standard of dress is lowered, then the standard of conduct is also lowered. And when the standard of conduct is lowered, then the sense of value in God's truth is lowered. See, one leads to another. Frank Garlock of Majesty Music warns, quote, If church starts using CCM, it will eventually lose all the other standards. The late fundamentalist Ernest Pickering gave a similar warning Quote, perhaps nothing precipitates a slide toward new evangelism more than the introduction of CCM music. This inevitably leads towards a gradual slide in other areas as well until the, not, the entire church is infiltrated by ideas and programs alien, meaning foreign, to the original position of the church. It will always bring you down into the pit. CCM. Every time. CCM is not just music. It's doctrine. It is philosophy of the Christian life. It is rock and roll Christianity. It is fundamentalist, anti-separatist. It is charismatic and ecumenical in doctrine and practice. And when it comes, it brings its philosophy. God warns His people to separate their false doctrine because of its corrupted influence. And wise have ears to hear. Let me just check the time here real quick. Um, there's a whole separate part here to get into, so I'm probably going to go ahead and end it there. So we're about at 12.30 there. Um, I'll go ahead and close this out in a word of prayer. Oh, do you want to go a little bit longer? Oh, okay. Um, Heavenly Father, we, we love you. We thank you, Lord God, for this day, for all your goodness, for all your mercy. Um, I praise you, Lord God, for that we, we are able to come together, Lord God, and in spirit, Lord God, I pray to God, in spirit and in truth, Lord God, because that's how we, we have to operate, in spirit, the Holy Spirit, and in truth. The Holy Spirit will always lead us to the truth. Lord, I do pray, God, that you would continue to reveal these truths to us, Lord God, that you would continue to do this, Lord God, with, with the true remnant, the body of Christ, Lord God, that you would wake them up, Lord, that you would do whatever it takes. I pray, Lord God, if it would even be your will, God, you would expand this group, God, but only according to your will, in the name of Jesus Christ, if it be your will. Lord God, I, I, or, or, or that I'd be able to get these recordings up on the internet. Lord God, I just pray that, um, for your glory, Lord, I pray to God that your name be glorified, that many would be saved as a result of your truth going forth. And I pray to God that your fear would be upon us, even in this room upon the body of Christ and upon the sin-sick world, Lord. And that, that fear, God, would continually drive us to repentance, to live right, God. Lord God, that ultimately you could use us as instruments fit for the Master's use, as the Bible says. I pray, Lord God, you bring us back at the next appointed time. I do also pray, God, that you would forgive us 
Lord God, for any and all sins that we've committed in any way, shape, or form, Lord God, that there would be nothing that would separate us from me, God. Because you said in your word, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I pray, God, for our unsaved family members, Lord God. Lord God, and, and I just pray that, Lord, your fear would be upon them. That fear would drive them to repentance, God, that, that you would show them the truth, God, that they would get saved, God. And your name would be glor- glorified through these things. And that, Lord God, that you would destroy the wicked works of the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ that are going forth right now, even in our own wicked government. Lord God, that's going on in the churches. I pray to God these charlatans, these liars, these devils in the name of Jesus Christ be exposed, God. Because if they're not exposed, they're just going to lead more people to hell, God. I pray to God you strip them of all their their ability to do wickedness and every evil entity that's operating and emanating through them, God. Be bound up and rebuked, Lord God. I pray to God they be cast in the abyss, these devils. That are working through. God, you said in your word that we battle not against flesh and blood. We, we don't battle against the people. We battle against the princes, the principalities, the rulers of wickedness and high places that emanate and operate through these human messengers. And I just pray to God that their wickedness be turned back and destroyed. I ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.